What brand do you think that is? Excuse me? That is an F bike, and you're going to hear why it's F bike. I'm guessing that you haven't seen that one. All right, so we'll, we will start. Um, I, I've given up my patience with not two minutes, it was just one minute. Um, so, uh, F bike was a company that I started with two partners back in 2012. Um, this was some advertising from uh, this woman, Jay, who worked for us, who was just super talented getting our website set up and all this. Um, uh, can't bring your bike on the subway, F that. F bike is allowed on all MPTA trains. Did you have to get a special permission for that? You had it like, be allowed to No, no. Uh, so any fold, it's a good question, and, and so Pepper be the questions. Um, folding bikes can be taken on the T at any time. Full frame bikes cannot go on the T at rush hour. Is there a step behind the rush hour? There is. Uh, can't fit a bike in your apartment. F that. F bike fits behind your couch. Tired of walking to work in the morning. F that. F bike will make your commute fun again. And I can attest to that since I ride F bike to work pretty much any good weather day that, that I'm not going out in the city afterward. Um, so the idea was born back in 2011. Uh, it actually, it turns out, was the, the name was registered back in 2007, I just discovered. Uh, so one of my partners was very forward think on, thinking on this. Uh, I was not present at this particular meeting, which I think was at a pizzeria Uno. Um, but the business plan was literally written on a cocktail napkin. I know I have a photo of it somewhere, but I can't find it, so this is just a generic screen grab of a cocktail napkin. Um, and, and the essence of the plan was, let's make money without doing much work. Um, that sounds phenomenal. <laughs> isn't it? Like, no one had ever thought of that before, but we came up with it. Um, and so we decided to market and sell folding bikes, and I'll explain why in just a second when I talk about the team, which is here. Um, so a guy that I used to work with, John Bush, ran a company called Equest, and Equest helped broker Chinese manufacturing capacity and U.S. need for, for products, and, uh, I guess uh, mostly industrial products. So if a U.S. company wanted something made in China, this guy John could, could get it done. He had a couple of partners in China who could connect with manufacturing plants. And so that's what he did. Um, he was over there probably quarterly, and every time he'd come back, he'd bring a folding bike. He's a cyclist like I am. Folding bikes were everywhere, and he would just bring them back because he could buy them for $25 over there. Um, and then with, uh, I'll sort of talk about what each of us did. He handled the manufacturing liaison and all the importing regulations. I handled marketing, sales, and customer service. And the third guy, John Reiner, handled, handled uh, warehousing and fulfillment. Um, so John happened to be an importer, so that was great having that skill set. And the other John happened to have a warehouse, which was a very important piece of skill set for um, warehousing stuff. Um, and uh, those two had been talking about a business they both uh, ran their businesses in Waltham, uh, and uh, and so I knew one of them, and he pulled me in and said, hey, we've got this great idea, you like bikes, folding bikes, we need sales and, and, and marketing experience, so, so let's do this thing. Um, so we selected from one of the 12 or 13 different bike models, spec'd up, well, we had a whole bunch of tasks, um, scraped together investment, first of all, we were going to buy a container of bikes, which is 375 of these in cartons. Um, we had to get the company registered, and this is the document that actually showed it was registered about four years before this conversation happened, the first conversation. Get uh, insurance, establish our trademark, uh, which is what you see across the top. Um, it turned out we first applied for a trademark just on f bike, and we were told that that was descriptive, and you can't trademark a descriptive thing. Now, we asked back to you know, successful, why can there be iPhone and iMovie? And it's clearly because Apple has better lawyers than we had. Um, but if we, we could trademark the graphical design representation of that bike, which is what we did. Uh, we had to figure out how to get things in through customs. We had to set up receiving. Uh, I'll show a couple of pictures of this in just a minute. Uh, manage the whole warehousing operation. Um, I guess I should have said, Somewhere up along there, actually specify the bikes, um, and, I'll, and I'll show a couple pictures of the bikes that you can see one right there. Um, create a sales and marketing plan, provide customer service, and a, a gazillion other things. Um, so the the bike is made by a company called Lang Two, and 
So the frame, like all the mechanical things are there. We didn't do any design. We did choices of things like steel or aluminum wheels, what kind of derailleur did we want on it, color and branding and that sort of thing. But the nice thing is they've made probably tens of thousands of these bikes and so there's a good non-failure record out in the field. Um, so this competes with bikes from a company called Citizen Bike, and these are just representative. Uh, they sell a $200 to $450 bike online. Uh, Dahan makes bikes that you'll see in bike stores. If you see a folding bike in a bike store, it's probably a Dahan or maybe a Turn. Um, Turn is the son of the Dahan guy who had a falling out with his dad and started his own company. Um, and then at the high end, Brompton and Bike Friday. So these are bikes you can easily spend thousands of dollars on. Um, very intricately engineered, they'll last a lifetime. Um, so we were thinking about where we wanted to be in that lineup. So the F-Bikes arrived in 2012, uh, 375 of them in a container, shipping container. This is the very front of the shipping container. Um, it turns out that those boxes go way back. If you do the math on how many you can see in that picture and how many rows there have to be to get the 375, it probably took about four or five hours for three of us to unload this. We then had to take them into the warehouse on little hand carts that would hold maybe four of these boxes. <laughs> and then we had um, warehouse racks, uh, two levels of which you could reach from the floor, but the top level you couldn't. And so we would climb up and hand them up and it was an OSHA disaster waiting to happen. Uh, no injuries ever happened, but it was close. Um, here's a little bit of the, the early unboxing effort. Um, and then the empty container, and it, you can't see how deep it is, but it seems like it goes back to Narnia. Yeah. Um, so we did three colorways. Colorway is kind of a, an ironic term for color, what other people would call color, but in cycling you market things up under a colorway. Um, we had a margarita green, a papaya orange, you can see it unfolded and folded, and, uh, and graphite gray. Um, and I'll do a quick demo. I don't know if you want to turn this a little bit, Andrew, but uh, I'll show what the, the folding mechanism is like. I don't know that I'm really practicing anymore because I don't ever fold it up, but you can do it in about 15 seconds. So knock the kickstand up, swivel this dial, drop the bar down, rotate the pedal to there, drop the saddle down, flip over the protection thing, fold it in half, and it's up on your head. Reversing the process, it's step to effect. I kind of do this just by feel, get the right place, but something to describe it up. So if you're at a T-station, not too bad to have to do. Um, I'll show some specs in just a second. Um, you can do this with it, but it's 31 pounds and you don't want to do that for long, particularly not in August. Um, <laughs> and compared to a really good road bike, it's maybe 15 pounds, so this is twice the weight of a road bike. Um, it's made of steel, the hinging mechanisms actually carry a lot of weight, um, but nothing on it is designed for lightweight. Uh, so the product specs, 31 pound steel frame, uh, the folding frame, handlebars, and pedals. I didn't show the pedals, I guess I would have done that. Um, so the pedals fold like that. Um, it, it turns out that if you want to store it behind a couch, you, you do what we call blade mode, which is like this, so it's long and narrow, put the saddle down, or you fold it up completely if you need to put it in the bottom of a closet or something like that, which we call cube mode. Uh, aluminum wheels with Kenda tires. So the aluminum wheel saves some weight. The Kenda tire is a pretty decent quality tire. Um, until I came to work here, I had the very original F bike, but it got stolen from here. So this is a much later model, but identical in pretty much all ways. Um, but I had probably been riding mine for four and a half years, maybe. Um, you know, other than things like, I don't think I ever, ever even changed brake pads. It's not a kind of bike you'd ride for 50 miles. Um, with that saddle, you don't really want to ride it for more than five miles um, because you'll be feeling it. But the idea is obviously short distance uh, riding. Um, even with the small wheels, it just takes more effort to, to move a, a certain distance. Uh, a six-speed Shimano derailleur. So that was kind of an upgrade, but we wanted a brand name on the shifting. Um, if you're a bike nerd, it's a one by six, meaning it has a single gear up front, six in the back. The up front gear is a 48 tooth and the ones in the back range from 14 to 28. And the ratio of that gives you some idea about the ease or difficulty of pedaling. So the bigger that ratio, um, the more the back turns for every turn of the front. 
uh, Fender's rack, and a bell. And then there's some aftermarket stuff I put on it, like lights. And, uh, so it came with the rack. I think everything else on there is stock. So, if you know the answer, don't say it, but what do you think we sold these for? It's like prices, right? But you don't get the bike. Because <laughs> <laughs> my old one is. You don't think we went high end, huh? It's a good gift. We didn't go high. So we sold these for $250 um, plus shipping. Shipping to, I think as far as New Jersey was $19.95, to California was $49.95. Um, I don't think we ever sold to Alaska or Hawaii. Um, which would have been, those were maybe $95 to ship. Um, people would ask us all the time, do we ship internationally? And we didn't, uh, we didn't have customs uh, ability to do that. And it, and it was super expensive. And for a $250 bike, you might spend $300 to ship it to, to, to Europe. So um, it would just make more sense to go buy a bike there. Uh, so here was the value proposition. It was a transportation appliance, uh, trying to connote uh, nothing special, no frills. Um, for uh, people living, commuting, or working in small spaces and with small wallets. So we had some advertising kind of built around that idea. Um, so a college student, a 20-something, living in a city, maybe in an apartment, or wants to take the bike inside at work and, and tuck it under a desk or something. Um, I guess if they had big wallets, they'd buy a Bronx or a bike Friday. Um, so we had three colors, papaya green, uh, margarita green, papaya orange, and graphite gray, as I said. Um, what do you think? Our guess was is how these would sell. Percentage breakdown. So this is what we decided, um, not what actually happened. So we went 25, 25, and 50. The thinking was, you know, for somebody who's kind of thinking about it, sort of more business like. I don't want to stand out. It's just a, a thing I have. That was going to be the bulk of our sales, and that was the gray. And then people who wanted to have a little bit more fun with the color might go green. The the, the orange. Um, we had one, one one shipment came in with almost a bronze color that was really hideous. Um, but it's not like we could return a container full of bikes. Um, but this was supposed to be sort of you know somewhere in between the bright fun and the the, the business like uh, and and. What actually happened wasn't too far off what we predicted. So 26% green, 18% orange, and 58% gray. So that's what people wanted. I'm trying to think, this may be a little bit artificially skewed. So one of the challenges is um, from the time we tell the factory that we want a container of bikes, it takes three months to get here. So six weeks of that is them finding time in their big production runs to schedule our small production run. And Six weeks of that is in the ship on, on the water. Um, is it that I maybe it was sixteen percent? We were that good, Steve. We sold one hundred two percent for every for every hundred percent. Um, so you had to be pretty good at predicting when you were going to stock out because you didn't want to be out of inventory. And sometimes we were. So we would be adjusting. I think we bought four containers. Um, of bikes, um, and so if, if we saw that the, the margarita ones were selling faster than we thought, we could skew the, the proportion in the later one. Um, so the, this um, 25-25-50 was the first container that we would adjust after that. Um, so our sales model, word of mouth, that's us talking to people, getting some press, doing events. Uh, we had a plan to have college students sell them on campus where they get 40 bucks for every bike they sold. We were going to approach high school PTOs and PTAs about making them a graduation gift and any other thing that we figured out along the way. Um, we had a website. Uh, this is using a company called Shopify, I think. So basically, we just didn't want to go to the trouble of getting a real e-commerce engine attached to a real website. We paid a little bit for the, the pleasure of having this, but it meant we could sort of just add water and have a website up and running very quickly. Um, glad I didn't show this first because it gives the price away. Um, product page and a support page and a blog and places where people could show their photos. Uh, we got local press. We did events. These are the Bike Friday events which you may hear about on I think it's a middle Friday in May. 
which is part of Boston Bike Month, uh, they have a big sort of festival set up at Government Center. And so you can commute in from all over the city. They have commuting caravans. So if you're new to bike commuting and you'd like to get some, uh, you know, sort of do it with somebody who's kind of showing you the ropes, they have volunteers leading these things. You show up and you get free a local burrito or a cup of coffee and you learn about uh, Zipcar and Urban Adventures and Hubway. Uh, they, one of the cool things, they have a bus out there and so they let you sit in the driver's seat of the bus and see the blind spots for the driver. And it's, you know, you never forget that when you're near a bus and you think about, you know, it's kind of a, can you see the driver's face in their mirrors? Because if you can't, they can't see you. And nothing much happened. So we, in May of 2012 was when we first actually had bikes that we could sell. We sold three. Um, we sold two in June. Three, three, zero, two, two, and two. So we'd sold 17 bikes by the end of December. And we're now starting to imagine that every birthday, Christmas, and other gift we ever gave to a family member or a friend for the rest of our lives was going to be a folding bike. We were thinking about, well, if we liquidate them. Oh, here's, here's another question. So we sold them for 250 What do you think we brought them into the country for? So this is bike, shipping, and duty. It's 100 bucks, slightly less. So it's about 80 bucks for the bike and roughly 10 each for the, the shipping and duty. Um, so, you know, $150 profit per bike, you know, gross profit, obviously. We had some expenses, uh, things like insurance and the website, but that wasn't a ton. Um, sometimes we'd give free shipping offers, so that would be a little bit. Um, so 2013 happened and we figured, well, things are gonna get better. Um, and we sold zero. Now keep in mind that the winter months, particularly when you're a Massachusetts-based company and you're doing word of mouth, means that there's a really cyclical nature. Um, we've got some, some data showing the warm weather states and the cold weather states. In the warm weather states, sales are pretty much flat at whatever level you're around. And in the, the cold weather states, it's just hyper-cyclical. Um, so the net result of that is still cyclical. Six, seven, four, and then 19, and then 28, and 78, and 70, and 36, and 15, and 15. Um, so what do you think happened between May and June? What did we figure out? This is how to sell. We, we stuck them in an Amazon store. And then we went back to all the people, let's see, I think the way the Amazon store worked is you could only do a review of the product if you had purchased it from us. But we pretty actively solicited reviews. And one of the things that we were known for was a customer service. So this is a good bike, but things would break. There's a plastic cover here that's really not necessary. Um, it used to be plastic inside and outside, and it was pretty easy to break that, and then people would want a replacement. Um, what else do you send out a lot of? Uh, you the, buy, so, like, we we actually just bought parts. So initially, we didn't have parts because we didn't know what we were going to need, and we'd strip bikes down. It's not a good strategy, though, because that only works if everything breaks equally, but it doesn't. It's always like this clip breaks on everything. And so then you've got 20 bikes in your graveyard that are all missing that, that <laughs> cover. Um, so then we figured out what to order and, uh, and, and um, sort of stock some spare parts. Um, so things would break. Oh, we had a big problem with the pedals. We initially had plastic folding pedals. And we were starting to get reports that they were breaking. And that's just super dangerous if you're riding a bike and a pedal breaks. And now we're thinking, do we have enough insurance? Uh, so we, uh, we quickly got an order of this metal Welgo pedal, Welgo's just the company, um, that we bought basically at retail and shipped them out to anybody who, who wanted them. We, told, we sent an email to every customer, look, we've had a few problems with this. Um, you know, we're not sure what's going on. It actually turned out we did some failure tests on the pedals and it was a bad design. They first replaced it with a plastic, a different, a better plastic pedal, um, but we weren't even comfortable with that, so we got these. But, so we would send out free pedals to people, and then we had to open about 300 boxes of bikes, pull the bike out. So the bike is folded in the box, it's in a plastic bag. So you have to open the top of the box. Pull the plastic bag out. You can actually get a pedal wrench into the box, and you can take the pedals off without pulling the bike out of the box. Um, I, think, I think maybe we couldn't do that. We tried doing that. So you actually had to get the bike out of the box, take the pedals off, put it back in the box. We got to the point where we could do that in about four minutes per bike. Um, it was just there was a method to it, but but that was kind of risky, right? I mean, literally somebody could die because of 
that. And um, it not only you know, would it be horrible um, for us financially because of being sued and everything, but you know, somebody could have died. So um, we quickly got that sorted out. That was the biggest problem that we had with the bike. Um, we, we couldn't exactly replicate it. So we, um, we knew something about gender of the, cust of the buyer, not necessarily the rider. So we were trying to say, well, on average, men are going to be heavier than women. So we'll, you know, are, are they breaking more for men? And they weren't. There weren't, there weren't that many breakages, so it was just hard to know. Um, maybe the bikes were falling over and it was cracking the pedal and then people were standing on it. Um, so we never really figured out what it was, um, although there was a, a, a weak element in the original pedals we had and then the, the first set of plastic ones were better. Um, we stress tested them, so we had this big rig, which was something called a come along, which is basically like a big strap ratchet thing. So it's got hooks on each end of a strap and a ratchet in the middle. And so we attached one hook to the frame of the warehouse shelves and the other to the pedal of the bike. Um, trying to think, oh, I think what we did is we screwed, we, screwed, we screwed the bike right into one of the holes in the warehouse frame. So we didn't have to worry about the bike moving. And we just cranked on this thing, and it, it measures stress, and you can see where it breaks. And the original plastic pedal broke at some, something like 200 pounds of pressure. The, the new plastic one was like 400 pounds, and the metal one was like 800 pounds. Um, so it was you know, potentially a disaster, but we averted it. Um, but by virtue of fixing things, customers were giving us five-star reviews, even when it was for a broken bike. But we, we, we send parts out for free. We wouldn't ask for them to send the bad part back. We weren't making them prove it. It was just, look, you know, we're sorry. We're a new company. All we can do is fix things as quickly as possible. And five-star ratings just started to mount up. And so by maybe a year into our time in Amazon, we were the top-rated folding bike, even though we were up against Dahan and Citizen Bike on, on Amazon. Um, and it was purely just because of our customer service. We, we had Dahan bikes, and we had Citizen bikes, and they were just as good as this. In some cases, they were better. Um, so here's what the big picture looked like. Um, so you can see sort of 2012 was bleak, and then things started to pick up in 2013, even more so in 2014, which is the blue. 2015 was, was green, um, and, and 2015 actually started off better. Um, and and um, for a mystery reason, I'll get to a minute, we, we stopped selling bikes. But nobody died. So this was basically the prospectus that we were using in trying to sell the company, um, and we didn't succeed in selling the company. Uh, here's sales by state. So 20% went to California. Um, by the way, oh, I don't know that I have the stat in here, but I think we sold about 70% through Amazon and 30% through our own website. And the only way people were finding our website is that they go to Amazon, and then they Google us, and then they come to our site, and then they'd say, I want a discount because I know if I buy direct from you, I don't have to give money to you. You don't have to give money to Amazon. So we would typically take Amazon's cut, which was 40 bucks a bike, and we give a discount of $20. So we kept half the savings and the customer kept half. Um, so California, New York, Mexico, New Jersey, Texas were the, the top states. And I, I could go back and look. I think we sold for 48 states. Um, so the end of the line. Uh, you can't grow F bike and do our day jobs. F that. So F bike closed the stores, declared victory, and went home. Um, we ended up being profitable. We sold just shy of 1,500 bikes. Um, still hear from people. Um, we managed to track us down. One of the things that when you shut a business like this, we, first of all, we had a year warranty. So we had to stay open and insured, most importantly, for a year. And then on the last day, on, you know, at 5 p.m. on that last day, or maybe it was midnight, I don't remember, we just disappeared off the face of the web. Everything just went away. Because now at this point, there's no company, there's no insurance, there's nothing. But we still get, we get, I get personal emails sometimes from, it was a guy, Steve Harvell, who's a cancer survivor, and he claims that this was the thing that did it for him, because his doctor said he had to go out and get active, and he was just not in a position to be a runner, and, and so he, he went out on the F-bike. Um, I'm pretty sure the doctor had more to do with it than we did, but it was really cool hearing him tell the story. He sent us pictures, like, still get photographs from all over the U.S. where he's got his bike at the Grand Canyon, or wherever. Um, so it's pretty cool. It, it, uh, it didn't make me a millionaire, that's for sure. Uh, and, and probably if I valued my time, I lost money on it. But it's really cool to learn how to run a business and all the things you have to think about and all the things that, that go wrong that you just kind of always you'll imagine. We never thought about spare parts until we started to experience spare parts and returns. 
Um, we had a, a 30 day return policy because we just sent it back for any reason they didn't like it. Um, and we'd get some back and we'd, we'd sell them the used So that's the, uh, the F bike story. Any questions? So, I, I like the idea of being a, a small business owner. Um, I don't know if I'd do it, I mean, it, it just depended on the idea. I think if it was an idea that I thought, oh, this can make money, but I wasn't psyched by it, mm -hmm. no. If it was the thing in the cycling industry, I'd be all over it. You know, if, I, if I thought I could you know, do as well as I could in an actual real company. So, maybe I missed this, but they were looking for somebody who could do marketing. Um, and you kind of took a note, but what was it for you that kind of, you know, made you want to do this? So it was the prospect of making some money. Uh, the initial investment wasn't horribly big, um, but it was, I think, I think we each had to put in 15000 to buy the first container of bikes and the insurance and have a little bit of money in the bank. Um, just total cycling nuts of the ability to try to do something and maybe grow it into a business in the cycling industry. The cycling industry is kind of notorious for being just bare bones margins. I don't know if you saw, there's a company, Velofix, uh, I think Alexand is it Alexandria, is that the office park? Um, they brought this company, Velofix, in. So Velofix is a big transit van filled with bike tools and, and spare parts. And so the, the office park brings them in and then you can schedule time with them and say, hey, Gunther, Gunther is the guy who runs this particular Velofix. So he's paid like 100 grand for the franchise, which gives him a certain set of zip codes. And office parks, individuals in office park hire him to fix bikes. Um, so that'd be really cool. But you know, I talked to him about it. He's just he's not making money yet. Um, if you're at a bike shop, that when you buy a new bike, the markup that the company, the, you know, the retailer is making is very little. They're making all their money on service and accessories like clothing, and helmets, and that sort of thing. So I was just uh, one guy that I worked with who spoke very highly of the other guy. So I, I knew I'd get along great with the people, uh, totally loved the idea of the product, and it was kind of getting a niche that, that we felt wasn't really being served. Um, and who knows, maybe it was going to turn into something. So if I'm hearing you correctly, really it's about your passion about cycling, and, and then it kind of expanded from that. Yep. I think if they'd come to me and said, you know, we've got a new folding nightstand, I would have said, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and... And in terms of the team, you know, it was great to have people that first uh, was one John, the, the, the two Johns. Yeah. And then so we met the other person and, you know, it's a good relationship. Um, I'm sure conflict happened. How did you address conflict? We really never had anything other than perhaps disagreements on opinion. Like, should we order more green than gray next time? Um, Fortunately, I won all those conversations because I had this massive spreadsheet of all everything that we sold and the cyclical nature, like orange sold better in the fall and green sold better in the spring, surprise. Um, so you know, we just generally didn't get too, too much into it. Um, we, were, we were so different in the parts of our business that we were focusing on. Like I just, I couldn't say anything intelligent about the importing side of things compared to what this guy had been doing this business for 10 years. Um, the other guy just you know, ran a, a warehouse business. He did fulfillment. They each had one person who probably spent maybe 10 or 20 percent of their time uh, doing things. Um, like one was a graphics designer, a website designer, the other was a guy in the warehouse who would pull bikes. So these, these would come in the cartons that you saw in the truck or in the, the cargo box. Um, we would just take them out, put them on the warehouse shelf, organized by color. When somebody ordered, we'd just print a UPS sticker, slap it on the box, and out it went. Um, that was in theory, in practice, when you had to open every box to replace pedals. It was a little more tedious than that. But once we got around that, um, the last two containers of bikes that we ordered, um, it, it was just, it was pretty easy. And so I think we sold, I think the average was maybe three bikes a day. So it was pretty cool. I get, you know, three times a day I'd get an email on average. Hey, you sold a bike. Cool. And I, so I would spend time, it was an evenings and weekends business, so I, I would, you know, kind of the end of the day is when I'd just sit down and email and go out customer. And so it does seem like customer service was a really big part of, you know, sort of the expansion and growth of the business. Yeah, because I think without that, we wouldn't have gotten the five-star reviews on Amazon, and without that, we wouldn't have sold bikes. 
right? You, you know how it is when you look for a product. If it's not on the first page, it just doesn't do it. And particularly when people are sorting by review, you know, the reason it's not on the first page is that good. And so, I mean, I don't know if this is so something you may have already thought about, about this, but would it have not made sense then to just um, transition all the sales to Amazon so that you wouldn't have the issue of margins? Yeah, so FBA is what they call it, fulfillment by Amazon. Yeah. We could have, um, it, it was a big problem because we were getting the container of bikes coming into Port of Boston. Then we had to get them to an Amazon fulfillment center, and that was going to be expensive. Amazon then took a pretty big cut compared to the, I don't know if it's the minimum wage, but a, a relatively low paid worker who was here doing it in 20% of the time week. Um, so we just, we stayed away with that. Um, then there was going to be the whole stocking of spare parts. Uh, it just made it, at the at sort of the scale that we ran it, it was the right way to do it. The, the big decision we had is did we grow it or shut it down? Um, and we tried to sell it, but we would have had to pay a broker so much that it was basically worth the revenue value of the inventory. So I think at the time we made the decision, we maybe had 200 bikes in inventory. We said, look, we'll just sell those. And, and basically all of our expenses are paid at that point. So those, and basically the last container, once you've paid for the container itself, everything is pretty much pure profit. And I, I don't think we would have sold it. I think we would have maybe broken even if we'd sold the business as opposed to just selling the inventory. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, you could tell um, we did put a note in that it was a little bit different the note was inspected by uh, <laughs> we, we didn't you know we, we didn't want to we didn't want to beg for people trying to sue us uh, and and technically it was true right uh, yeah. so I, I guess you know it obviously it was a safety issue um, how many uh, people experienced this failure before you took action and how long did it take to take action? I'd say there were around 10 people who said this broke while in use. Um, uh, you know, one guy said, you know, the, the worst that we heard is somebody scraped up and banged something. There was no broken bones, there were no, uh, you know, no concussions or anything like that. So I think we got lucky with that. Um, the second, we, we started to get these relatively early on. And we probably had the replacement pedals in house in two weeks, um, and so basically we just kind of dragged their feet on shipping stuff during those two weeks and just let people, you know, wait for their bikes so that we could replace them. Um, I think we probably sent out thirty or forty sets of pedals of, you know, to people who already had their bikes. And then, how did you address the issue going forward with the manufacturer and you know getting the bike? Yeah, we, you know, we we expressed displeasure. We wrote a strongly worded letter. Um, this is a company, so Lang2, they build bikes, if you know the company Giant. I think Giant sells the most bikes in the world. Um, reasonably high-end racing machines all the way down to, to cruisers. Um, so a lot of Giant bikes are built at this factory. Um, this factory, their catalog, they have something like 60 different models of folded bike. So some of them are more... Um, Kind of fancier looking, so chrome on them. It sort of looked more like, you know, a thing you'd wear if you were or ride with if you're wearing a suit. Um, some were much sportier. They had a, a carbon fiber version. They had one of the things we thought about is if we were going to grow the business, did we need to change add model lines? So we brought in a, an aluminum bike that was better gearing, better components, significant, significantly probably four pounds lighter. Um, and, but it was just then we were just going to take our inventory challenges and multiply them. Yeah. You, skew prolifer pro proliferation is huge. When yeah. you've got three colors of one model, it's kind of manageable. Trying to figure out how to fill a container when you might have three models and four colors of each, all of a sudden you can very quickly run out of things. And when you've got that three month lead time to get new product. That's, that's fun. So we would, when we're selling three a day, that's roughly a hundred a month. So in about three months, we could sell a container's worth of bikes, um, which was about the amount of time that it took to arrive. So it's almost like you, you, you receive a container and you're thinking immediately about ordering the next one. So 
you know, for the viewers who are listening in, what would you say would be the major learning point? Um, it's great doing business with friends if it works out. I think you run the risk of losing a friendship. I'm, I'm guessing because ours worked out well, um, but, but I think I would be careful about going into a relationship that way again. Three of us was nice, so we basically would vote on things. We had a shareholders agreement, so an ownership agreement, so we had a mechanisms for solving problems, basically the majority rule. Um, I think be prepared for the thing you're making to not satisfy 100% of the customers and have a plan for how to rectify things quickly. Because again, we're in a world where you're just constantly going to be reviewed, and whether it's on Amazon or anything else, I would say sell on Amazon. Um, the forty dollars they took out of a two hundred fifty dollar price—that's what we were going to give a college kid. But we we hired six college kids. I want to say hired. We gave them a bike to take this around campus, put up flyers, put up postcards, do whatever you think of, um, and we never sold a single bike through through a student. I don't know if college kids think they're dorky. I mean, you, know, you see somebody riding around on this and you instantly thought it's sort of clown bike. Um, it's like, yeah, it looks like a clown right up until the point that I can put, take it on the tee when it's raining and other people are riding their bikes in the corner. Um, Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I hope more people step up and do brown bag lunches for things outside of ODL. Because Brett and I were talking about this a little bit. Imagine everybody here has a thing they could talk about that would be, oh, I didn't know they did that. And, and find it. Excuse me? Well, there's one, two, three, there's six of them right here in the room. <laughs>